All right, now that we have seen how to do channel coding over an AWGN channel, it will not be that many modifications to get it to work over a fading channel. So I'm just gonna walk you through that. So what are, what are we doing? We have basically the same setup as before, but we just have the received symbols are being multiplied by this fading. And remember, we're assuming that the fading is known and that it is IID or independent on every um, symbol. So it's basically the same setup to do it over fading. You just have to do a couple of little tricks. The first is you have to introduce what's called an interleaver and a deinterleaver, and you also have to do equalization. And if they're not that hard, if you do them correctly, you will get good performance, but you have to do them correctly. And there are a lot of details and many students mess up these details and don't get the performance that they are expecting. So make sure you read this, listen to this carefully and try to make sure you get all the details correct. But if you do, you'll get good performance and I'm gonna show you that right now. So let's walk through those two extra sets of blocks and the first one is equalization. What is equalization? So remember that we have a received symbol is being is the transmitted symbol multiplied by this fading gain H plus noise and we want to recover that symbol S from the received R. Now, um, we're going to take that, we want to, of course, take that S and it's going to be ultimately fed in to our soft decision block, which will be needed for the LLR. Now, the simplest way to do that is just what's called channel inversion, which we already talked about. You just take the receive symbol and you divide by H, and then you get the symbol S plus some noise where the noise is scaled by one over H. Now, remember that the LNR doesn't just need the symbol estimate, it also needs an estimate of the error on that, which is the noise estimate. But if we know the noise on W, we can get the noise on this equalized symbol by dividing by H squared. But remember that when H is small, that means that noise will be very large and hopefully your LRs will then tell you that those symbols are unreliable. So that's partly how this is working in fading. An alternate technique is what you would call MMSCE equalization. So it's the same setup. We have our transmitted symbol multiplied by H. But in this case, you say my symbol estimate is going to be a linear function of R. For example, it could be one over H, but I'm going to pick that S hat to be what's called the minimum mean squared error. So it's on average as close as possible to S. So basically I just substitute in this alpha here and minimize this expression over um, alpha. So if you've taken a basic probability class, you've probably done this calculation. If not, you can just look at the formulas and they're pretty easy to uh, work out. And it tells you that if you have a, you need a statistical model for the true distribution S, all right? And it tells you that the alpha is given by this ratio here. This ratio will be the symbol energy times the conjugate of H plus something on the denominator here. Now, what turns out is that if this noise is very small, this turns out to be one over H, like channel equalize, uh, inversion, but it, on other expressions here, it doesn't blow up with the noise being small. And because it doesn't blow up, it tends to have a lower uh, noise estimate and tends to be much more stable when you combine it with the LLRs. Both channel estimation and MMSE are not optimal. Ideally, you would do the symbol equalization and the decoding jointly, but that's much harder. So these are both approximations, but in practice, the MMSE works out a lot better. If you don't believe me, try the simulations with doing channel inversion. You'll see you lose about dB or two. All right, interleaving and deinterleaving. This is also a pretty easy block. The idea is this. Well, imagine that you have some channel that's coded varying like this, and it's varying slowly over this block. So when there's a deep fade, what will happen is it will knock out bits. With coding, that's not a problem because we can normally recover them from other bits. However, if you just do your code without the interleaving, it will knock out a whole bunch of bits that are uh, together in a code. And that hurts a lot of types of code, particularly things like 
uh, convolutional codes will perform very badly. They'd rather have those errors randomized out through the whole process. So what you need to do is want to do something called an interleaver. So you want to shuffle the bits before the mapping of the symbols and then de-interleave the LLRs when you get them out. And that way it kind of randomizes the little locations. That little trick will actually buy you quite a bit. And these are the kinds of details that I was telling you about. Now, there are many interleavers used in practice. For example, you can just generate the random sequence by a um, by any random number generator, but there are also some more hardware efficient ones. Again, MATLAB is amazing. It has all sorts of classic interleavers in it, block interleavers, algebraic interleavers, matrix uh, interleavers, and so on. So um, all these tools are there. I'm just going to do for my simulation a very simple random interleaver, but go ahead and try these other ones if you're interested. So that is all you have to do. If you get all those details correct, you can actually get this kind of performance. So here is just a vanilla convolutional code, all right, with a moderate constraint length, and the blue line is what you get with AWGN. Needs about, let's say, a block error rate of uh, 10 to negative 2, maybe needs a little more than 4 dB or something like that. With fading, it does worse, but it's not that much worse. It's, you know, 8, 9 dB or something like that now. 5 dB is, is not nothing, but this is much, much better than what we had with uncoded modulation, which was needing dramatically more uh, error. So the lesson to be learned here is that if you take coding and you do it all those other details correct, you will have something that hurts with fading, but not nearly as bad as what you would have had with uncoded modulation. Now, how to implement that? MATLAB's amazing tools, you can actually build that simulation in just a few lines. It's a convolutional coder, we already talked about that. We just take, uh, they have a whole function just for the random interleaver, then we modulate, remember we interleave before the modulation, and then we pass it over a uh, channel, a random channel, in this case I'm just uh, creating IID samples. And then I do equalization, and the equalization is just that formula, which I already talked about. You remember you get equalized symbol and the noise variance. And then you um, compute the LLRs without quantum demand. Then you de-interleave and pass it to the decoder. And look, just 10, 15 lines of code, you have a fully functional system to go over fading, and you can get that performance you had on the last slide. All right, so let's take the summary. So Fading causes variations in SNR, as we've seen here, and that is coming physically, at least for small-scale fading, that is coming physically from the constructive and destructive interference of paths that varies over space when you have motion or in frequency because of delays. If you take uncoded modulation, it dramatically de increases the average error rate. And to get any type of reliable communication, you would need to add a significant what we call fade margin. That's on the order of 20 dB if it's really fading. So this is going to get a big X mark as a way to transmit. Another option is if you can code, if you can code, but you have slow fading, that means all the symbols are fading together. The coding still helps, it always helps, but it doesn't get around the fundamental problem of fading because all of these bits will either fail together. So in this case, this will not really get around mitigating the channel. As I said, though, if you're in a, stuck in a flow of fading situation, there may be ways that you can get around this. We're going to talk about some of that from a protocol perspective next unit. But if you have coding and fast fading, meaning that you can get a lot of IID fades, a lot of independent fades within your coding block by either making it really big in frequency or really big in time, um, then you can, even if some parts fail, other parts of the code can actually recover if you get all the details on your decoder correctly. And in that case, you will get much better performance. So in this, we have wrapped up a quick discussion of some of the effects of fading, but we saw it understood physically in the previous unit, and now we saw it, how it influences coding. Next unit, we're going to talk a little bit about one more higher level on 
the math layer. With this though, you'll be able to do the problems in the lab and in the lab, you're gonna actually build a new radio or not build, just use MATLAB's tools to simulate a new radio downlink channel with all its glory and its coding. And you're gonna see its performance over an actual fading channel.